there we go. Uh, so COPD exacerbations, we see these a lot at our hospital, especially during the uh, hot summer months and the winter months. And uh, a definition, um, you can see there's an article on your table, by the way. It's pretty short, very uh, concise, and also feel free to, to look through that. Um, but most of this comes from there. The definition of a COPD exacerbation is any acute change in a patient's baseline shortness of breath or dyspnea, um, if their cough is increasing, or if they're making more sputum than usual. Um, any of those things that are significant enough to make us change some part of their treatment um, is considered a, a COPD exacerbation. So the average patient with COPD has an exacerbation 1.3 times per year, so one to two times uh, every single patient. Um, so there, there's a couple of cases that I wanted to point out from uh, people that have been here at our hospital. And uh, case number one is a 73-year-old gentleman. He has known COPD. He was on home oxygen. And he was admitted through the emergency room for a severe, or what I would consider, and we'll talk about classification later and severity, but I considered a severe COPD exacerbation. He came up to the floor of um, 2 South on BiPAP. Um, and the reason he was placed on BiPAP was because he had an abnormal ABG and he also had increased work of breathing. Uh, and we'll talk about some of that stuff uh, more later as well. Now, he, some of his symptoms and the reason he came to the ER, he had very severe fatigue and weakness, worse than any of his other exacerbations that he'd had in the past. And he is one that usually had about one or two every year. Um, he was started on IV Salumedrol, Rosefin, and uh, Oral Zithromax and also Q3 hour doing that's when he first got here. So this was his chest x-ray on the very first, like in the emergency room. He was on BiPAP at the time, so it was done portable. So, um, and then I put this x-ray up over here because that's something that was done after he was off the BiPAP, he was doing better, he was able to go down to radiology, stand up, put his arms up, take a deep breath, and they could do it PA and lateral, so two views, and this is kind of, um, I just kind of wanted to point out the difference also between the two ways of taking an x-ray. Um, and we always encourage, if the person is able now, because he was on BiPAP, he really wasn't able to go to radiology and get the x-ray done as a two view. But we get a lot more information, as you can see over on this one. You can see the lungs so much better on the two view, the PA and lateral. Um, now here, on this one, he was read as having a left basal or infiltrate. They called this a pneumonia over here. Um, and over here on this one, they said the pneumonia had resolved the next day. So that's why he was started on Rosefin and Zithromax, because with the pneumonia pathway, um, you know, we thought that's what we were treating was that, leading to the COPD exacerbation. Um, we'll look at x rays a little bit more later. So the second case is a 77 year old female. She's a longtime smoker. She was admitted with what I would consider a moderately severe COPD exacerbation and hypoxemia. Um, she had no previous diagnosis of COPD, uh, but it was very evident on the x-ray as well as just listening to her and with her history of you know, smoking for so many years. Um, she had the symptoms. She came in because of cough and severe weakness. That was her reason for coming to the ER. She was started on nasal cannula oxygen. She was on IV rocephin as well as IV salumedrol, and she had her doing every four hours. This was her x-ray. So it was read as no infiltrates, but obvious COPD changes or chronic lung changes. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot of things that you can see on x-ray that make you think that they have emphysema or some kind of chronic obstructive process like COPD. Um, they usually have hyperinflation, so you'll be able to see that the, the lungs are a whole lot longer and that there's more ribs to be seen and also usually the diaphragm is very flat. And uh, we'll see a, a comparison of this x-ray to a normal lung x-ray of a lady who's about the same age, um, just a little bit here, and you can kind of see the differences. So um, there's a lot of different symptoms that can show up with COPD exacerbations. Um, they actually are not that simple and straightforward sometimes to diagnose because a lot of it is based on history, and a lot of people who have COPD or are at risk of having an exacerbation of COPD have all kinds of other problems like heart failure. So they could come in with fluid overload and look just like they're having a COPD exacerbation because they're breathing fast and you know, all these things. And, and so a lot of it um, gets confusing and, and it's hard to sort of pinpoint what exactly the problem is. But here's some of the symptoms that we see a lot. Um, You'll see chest tightness or, or a fast heart rate. Um, they might not be able to get around. They'll say, oh, you know, I've just been more tired every time I get up to walk around. I, I can't get to the bathroom. I'm weaker. 
um, they could be confused, they could have uh, tr trouble sleeping because they're not breathing well, they're not getting enough oxygen. In, in the lungs, of course, we talked about how the definition is to their increased cough, their, um, a change in their sputum, um, and a change in the way that they're breathing. So they might feel that they're wheezing, they might be breathing faster, working harder to breathe. Uh, they can also have fevers, even just with a COPD exacerbation. They don't have to have a pneumonia just because they have a fever. Um, sometimes that goes along with it. So things that you should do when you think somebody might have a COPD exacerbation is to first check their pulse ox. So we want to see what their oxygen level is, if they need oxygen. Um, and then if they're hospitalized, the article suggests that these things should be checked for sure, these ones right here in the middle. Um, and then at the bottom, that's consider performing if you're, if you're trying to figure out you know, if they have other issues going on alongside of the COPD exacerbation. Um, now, in ABG measurement, the, the article definitely recommends that if they have to be hospitalized, if they're severe enough to need hospitalization, they should probably have a, what they consider a room air ABG um, done when they first get to the ER just to get a baseline to find out what their oxygen level is and what their CO2 level is so we know what we're dealing with. You know, either, yeah, their pH is very low or their CO2 is very high, their oxygen is very low, you know you're looking at more of a severe case. Um, and we don't always get this, and sometimes it's not necessary, and we'll talk about that in a little bit here too, but uh, definitely something to keep in mind, and it is you know, considered the gold standard for somebody who's hospitalized, so uh, we have to keep that in mind too. Granted, we get a lot of people who might be you know, no code, a comfort care, and things like that, and sometimes we treat them a little bit differently than you know, the, the guidelines aren't really for that necessarily, so each person is still an individual. Uh, but doing a chest x-ray is a good way to go. You definitely want to see if they have a pneumonia, although, as we noticed, it's hard to tell that sometimes when they first come in. Um, but at least you can treat them for that in the meantime while you figure it out. So. Uh, then you can get a, uh, um, some labs. We usually get a CBC and, and metabolic panel and everybody to kind of see what's going on. Um, you get an EKG as well. Um, and then down here, as we talked about, people with COPD often have all these other problems like heart failure, and, uh, and they might have some coronary artery disease or be at risk for cardiac ischemia, and then you may need to check some cardiac enzymes. You may want to, um, most people we end up checking a BN, BN is a Nancy P, so uh, because that can show us if it's you know, very high, we might start to think, oh, you know, maybe it's not all COPD, maybe it's CHF, or maybe it's a combination of the two. <coughs> So chest x-ray, as I promised, this is our lady, um, the case number two, 77 years old, saying she has severe COPD. Those changes are very obvious on there. And this is a 77-year-old female with normal lungs. Granted, she has a lot of hardware. That's all. Saying, That's wow. <laughs> incidental <laughs> finding. <laughs> Nothing to worry about there. Um, but if you look at her lungs, you can see, with females especially, you can see where the breast shadow is. And if you look at that, her lungs are way above, here's the breast shadows right there. So her uh, lungs are way above that, right? And she has nice round diaphragms here and here. And her heart kind of gets in the way, but um, so you can see that pretty easily. Now she's got a lot of markings and things like that. I mean, all that's, that's normal. That's okay to have. I mean, she's 77 years old. She's going to have some things. But um, if you look at this lady, her breast shadows are way up here, and there's lung way below that. So she, over the years, has been hyperinflating her lungs, you know, keeping that oxygen and other um, air trapped in there, and just, it can't get out. So it gets hyperinflated, and if you look compared to nice and smooth round diaphragms here, hers are very flat. They're very flat on the other side, so it's actually pretty striking what you can see when they do that. So a lot of times if you read these chest x-rays, if we were to look at all the chest x-rays we do for people who come in for things that might not be even related to lung necessarily, we a lot of times see Patients have COPD and they don't know it, or they have some sort of chronic lung change and they don't realize it. That math is making me crazy. Okay. Uh, the uh, indications to hospitalize, this is all in the article to it, it suggests, and we do this a lot, um, if the patient obviously has respiratory distress or they're at risk of distress, which is all those people with those other comorbidities like heart failure, 
coronary artery disease, and a lot of times we admit people like that that may not be in a severe COPD that's but they might not need BiPAP or anything like that, but they need to be admitted, they need to be watched because they are the ones that could potentially get worse. You don't want to send them home. So um, the inpatient mortality for COPD exacerbations is relatively low, three to four percent overall. But if the patient is sick enough to need to go in the ICU, they have a very big mortality rate over the next year. Um, if they're that ill and they need to go there, they are intubated or whatever, 43 to 46% risk of death within the next year, that's that's pretty significant. Now, those people are generally pretty sick to begin with, they have all these other comorbidities, so we, we see that a lot. All right, so this is, um, in the article, this is their idea of severity. This is their classification of what exacerbations are like. So mild ones, they don't need to be hospitalized. They can be controlled with just maybe having them use their albuterol inhaler a little bit more often or um, increasing the dose of whatever other inhaler that they're on. Uh, they don't need steroids. They don't necessarily need antibiotics or anything like that. Very mild. Mod a lot of times those patients just self-medicate. Do it themselves. They get over it. They don't even have to be seen in the clinic or the, or the hospital. Um, and then moderate for them, they say if they require um, oral steroids or oral antibiotics or a combination of the two, which we see a lot in the clinic, um, then they would call it moderate. Uh, severe, that's the one that requires hospitalization. Um, or just being seen in the emergency department. We have a lot of those people you know, that come through and they either treat it down in the ER, they get sent home maybe on the um, oral steroids and antibiotics, that kind of thing. Now, this down here is my thing. This is, um, you know, people that are severe um, and have to be hospitalized, they also have, you know, there's a whole spectrum of that. We have a lot of people that come in and just because of their risk factors and something could go wrong, we keep them and we watch them closely and you know, treat them, but they might not need oxygen and they might not need, um, you know, BiPAP or anything like that. Well, I would call those people mild. So, in my mind, mild exacerbations that are, require hospitalization don't really need an ABG. They can probably be treated with uh, oral steroids and oral antibiotics instead of IV stuff. Uh, that would be reasonable. But I think pretty much anybody that has to be hospitalized, just because they're risk factors or whatever, they should at least get every four hour nebulizer treatments to start. You know, especially if they're coming in at night and it's going to be overnight, we don't want to not treat them. You know, because at home, they probably would be using that probably every four hours or, or even more often sometimes. So, um, but again, th those are the people that they're not working hard to breathe. They don't need oxygen. That's what we see that from time to time. Moderate, I'd say most of our people that we treat for COPD exacerbations fall into this category. They require oxygen and or they have some kind of increased work of breathing. But they're not bad enough that they need a BiPAP and their ABG is normal. But I would say those people really could use an ABG so that we know with their work of breathing or their need for oxygen that you know, their, their oxygen levels and their CO2 levels are doing okay. Um, and for them, this is how I think of how um, we would treat them. I would give IV solumedrol because I feel like it uh, helps to get them off of their oxygen a, a little bit quicker, um, kind of opens things up, keeps them, it sort of prevents them from decompensating or prevents them from getting worse. Um, and then I would usually do IV antibiotics. Generally, we do Rocephin unless they have an allergy. Um, and then they might actually, when they first get here, when they're in the emergency room, need back-to-back -back nebulizers or a one-hour continuous nebulizer. And I get a lot of that. The ER doctor will call me and say, hey, you know, I got this guy down here. He was working hard to breathe. And we gave him, you know, back-to-back -back nebulizer. But now he's working a lot better. But he's at risk. You know, he's got these other problems. So we'll just admit him and watch him. What do you want to use? So they often ask me. So. I think uh, I'll just type this up and maybe help the, uh, give it to the ER and, and let them know, you know these are kind of my preferences, what I think of, if this is what they're needing. So then severe would be like our case number one. Now moderate is what uh, case number two, that's where that lady fell. Um, she needed oxygen. She didn't really have an increased work of breathing, at, as, at least once she got up to two south, she didn't. Um, but she did receive all these things. She had an IV cytomedrol and the Q4 hour nabs and antibiotics and all that. Um, now severe, that's like the first guy that we talked about who needed BiPAP. His ABG was abnormal. He did have some respiratory distress when he got there. Um, he was very, very fatigued and uh, very kind of sleepy, but able to be woken up. So well, I would say for them, you know, every three to four hours of the nebulizers, they might also need back-to-back -back or one hour continuous uh, when they first, you know, when they first present to the 